I'm going to do this differently in three ways. First, I'm going to go so fast that if you look at your BlackBerry, you'll miss half the presentation. The second is I'm going to invert the traditional way of approaching a presentation like this. Typically, you would have three slides on the past, three or four on the present, and then you would spend a lot of time talking about the next few years. I'm going to invert that. I do not believe you can understand what is going on now or what will happen over the next couple of years without a deep understanding of what caused this crisis. So a lot of my presentation will be on history which is actually safer ground because it's data as opposed to forecast. So uh, hold on for the ride. I'm, I, uh, I was listening to Lucy Kellaway on the way in, and she talked about a new party that was against PowerPoints, and I realized I was going to violate everything she advised me to do, so I turned to Class 95 instead. I would argue that we are entering the fourth phase of the modern era. You will be familiar with these phases, although the way I cut them may be different than what you learned in your history books. The first phase from 1900 to 1945 was a boom, a bust, and a war. Actually, there were a couple of wars in that period. What caused it? There's a lot written about it, but one of the main causes was that productivity grew so quickly that it created haves and have-nots, and the political and market institutions could not keep up. A number of ideologies developed to deal with that era, some of which were quite problematic, like fascism and communism. The next stage we used to refer to as three worlds, but there were actually four. The first world were the developed world we now think of as OECD or maybe the G7. Then there was the communist world, which we, I refer to as veneer growth. It wasn't as strong as people thought. There was a third world, though, that had embraced capitalism, but it was too early to notice. A lot of those countries were in Asia. However, if you take the four main tigers, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, they represented only 3% of the world economy. Finally, you had a large part of the world, almost 3 billion people, it says five here, they misread what I wrote, 3 billion people who were really not part of the world economy. In the next phase, which was an incredibly exciting phase for the world. It was the triumph of capitalism. I had to decide what year to start that with. I chose the year of Mao's death. 78 was the year that Deng really ascended to power and began his reforms in China. But it was clearly the emergence of China that embarked this next era. It was an era where country after country began to embrace capitalism and reject some of the socialist or other philosophies that preceded it and they became part of the world economy, and their productivity improved, and it was a period of great prosperity. The challenge for that period, which is the focus of today's presentation, is it ended because massive imbalances emerged because people pursued strategies, or countries pursued strategies that were not sustainable. So we are now in a new era, which I am terming turbulent rebalancing. The OECD has gorged, the bill must be paid. There's competition for resources that will increase, not decrease, over the next decade. Growth rates are disparate, and there will be convergence in the standard of living. That will be painful, because it will probably require some decline in standard of living in the West, as it approximates the increasing standard of living in the worlds that have embraced capitalism. This phase will end when the imbalances have been addressed. This will take some time, 10 to 20 years. Let's look at how good the last phase was. There are two pieces of data on this graph. The first is the net growth of world GDP. Those are the bar graphs. In the last phase, net growth of world GDP was $34 trillion. Think about that. When you look at the size of what needs to be done, $10 billion to help bail out Greece for the next round, et cetera, you realize just how large the world economy is, how many resources we have to draw on if we have the political will. The second is the population growth. In that 30-year in that period, 30, 35-year period, almost 2.5 billion people were added to the world economy. And per capita income improved by $3,500. That is an enormous increase when you think about a lot of people who used to live on only three or $400 a year. 
So why did the phase have to end? I'm going to cover five root causes of what I call the end of the triumph of capitalism, the imbalances that need to be addressed for us to return to some kind of new normal. The first I'm going to focus on is that the OECD governments were irresponsible, they overcommitted, and they overborrowed. On this graph, you have two pieces of data. From 1990 to 2010, plus a forecast for five years, of the debt levels of the G7 countries. Now, about 70% of this debt, on average, is Japan and the US. So those are the two main culprits of this problem. If we look back, we can see that even in a boom period from 1990 to 2007, debt rose from 36% of GDP to 58 to 58 percent. That is too high a level. During this time, Singapore was wrapping up surpluses. So there's a big gap between what Singapore and some of the Asian countries were doing and what was happening in the G7. The forecasts are for this to go to 90 percent of GDP by 2015. If you are interested, you should read Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff's book, This Time is Different. They have looked empirically at all the financial and banking crises over the last eight centuries that they could get data on. And they've established, I think, in a compelling way, that there is this magic line of about 90% of GDP after which you are putting your government on an unsustainable pace and you are likely to end in crisis. So the average of the G7 is approaching a crisis level according to some very thoughtful economists. Let's look at Europe. The light gray is 2010. The dark gray is a forecast for 2020. You can see Greece is the problem trial, but Italy is clearly right after. I used to think that to understand whether Europe would come out of this, you need to focus on Greece. But it's not really Greece. Greece is very small. The problem is that Italy is seven times as big as Greece. And what people are concerned about is whatever precedent they set for Greece, will then be applied to other countries. And if they are too generous to Greece, then other countries will lack the discipline to take the hit themselves and will expect the northern Europeans to bail them out. So while a lot of people see a political system that is in crisis, they're actually dealing with some quite fundamental issues. The challenge is they joined a club, they set up a club, and allowed members that would then embarrass them and hurt their reputation. That choice was probably incorrect to allow some of these people to join the EU. Now they're stuck with a choice and they have to deal with it. I do not think Europe will deal with this issue as a multi-country institution as well as the US will as a single country institution. Now I just for reference, I wanted you to see the debt levels of Japan, or sorry, of China and India, far lower, and particularly with their higher growth rates, certainly not problematic. Now what are people spending on? The two main culprits in the U.S. are defense spending and health care. One of the things I do for a living is help turn around companies that are in financial trouble. That's my job. When I go in, I always listen politely for the first couple of weeks. And I hear story after story of this can't be cut, that can't be cut, this is something that we have to do. And I listen politely and at the end of it I say this is nonsense. You are bankrupt if you continue the way you are. Either you will break up and be sold off as pieces, or you will make the tough choices to restructure and downsize to something that becomes a viable entity. I do not see business as that different from government. The question, the, what I will be proposing is the answers are relatively clear. The question is always about political will.